Investors actually do care about you and they want to follow your progress. Make sure you keep your venture profile up to date, share your developments, you closed a new deal, you hired someone, you opened a new market, ask for help. I call it leads and needs. What do you need and what leads can we give you? All right? Build a following. How many people like your venture? Promote your company. Get references, social proof. Engage your community. All right? You can read this all later. Get feedback. Engage a mentor. How many founders here that are at the pre-Series A level have advisory boards with advisors? A few? You should raise your hand, Lula. One of our portfolio companies. How do you, how do you incentivize your advisory boards? I'm on your advisory board, so I know the answer, but anyway. Incentivize your advisors. Advisors don't want money, they want upside. So ask your advisors, an advisory board is different from an operational board. Operational board members have a financial and legal and fiduciary responsibility as board members. Advisory board members are there to give you strategy, networks, resources, partnerships, and commercial scaling. And they need to be incentivized. Before your Series A, get an advisory board. If it's one person, two people, or five people. Right, and conduct DDs on your investors. Okay. Fuck, it is hot. Um, Cape Town, to Innovation City's point earlier. An amazing city, one of the top tech hubs in, in Africa. What makes Cape Town special? I think the mayor is going to be here sometime a couple of weeks from now. I should give these slides to him so he can, yeah. What's that? <laughs> um, why is this slide important? If you happen to be a startup founder anywhere in South Africa or the world, you don't necessarily have to build your product or solution only in that city. You have to look for components or characteristics of cities that help you scale. So if you happen to have the disadvantage of launching a product in Bloemfontein, sorry, people from Bloom, think about does Bloemfontein meet all these characteristics? If it doesn't, move your team somewhere else. Maybe Cape Town, maybe Bangalore, maybe Tel Aviv, maybe New York. So what are some of the characteristics of thriving startup ecosystems? A, a, a pool of talented tech-savvy entrepreneurs, not just developers, designers, but digital marketers, people in advertising that can constantly fuel your growth. Risk capital. This is unfortunately where Cape Town falls short. So it's not just money, it's risk-adjusted capital. So where do you have high net worth individuals, family offices, VC funds that are aware of early stage VC as an asset class? I have this photo here <laughs> just to show you how, how crazy South Africa is. It's purposely small so you can't see it, but if you really squint, you can. That's me, believe it or not, like seven or eight years ago, talking to a bunch of people in South Africa, I wouldn't name them, but if you, you can figure out who they are. Just put it this way, if a bomb went off in that wine cellar, we would have lost maybe half the GDP of South Africa. I'll just put it that way. That's me pitching to some very respectable people in wine country, I'll just call it wine country, <laughs> about the importance of tech innovation in Africa and explaining to them what venture capital is and how we can start doing good by investing in tech companies. I'm sure most of you figured out who they are. Um, and what's their investment into tech and VC? It's pretty much zero. But the point is, risk capital is not really that great here. So don't bark up the wrong tree forever. Move on. And if you can't raise money here, raise money somewhere else where people have a better risk attitude, right? So just because you happen to live in gardens or Timburskloof or Seapoint, it does not mean you only have to talk to Cape Town VCs or Stellenbosch VCs. Understand people's risk reward trade-off, right? A lot of people get stuck in step two and they never move on and they say, oh, no one loves me. 
<laughs> collaborating with corporates. One of the biggest challenges that startup founders have is that they have no control over distribution. Distribution is the biggest killer of a startup. The cost of acquiring customers in South Africa is ridiculously high. But who controls distribution in this town, in this country, in this continent? Insurers, banks, telcos, retailers. So if you want to get your hands, if you want to get your product into the hands of, you can be building a payments app, an e-commerce app, an ed tech platform, a telemedicine platform, whatever you're building, if you don't have distribution to insurers or retailers or telcos or banks, good luck. You have to work with corporates and you have to learn the subtle art of sacrificing margin for volume, right? So revenue share. Accelerators, join an accelerator. There are hundreds of good accelerators all over the world. Startup Bootcamp, Antler, Y Combinator, Tech Stores, Nylab, Founders Factory. Join them or at least apply because they can really help you figure out your product market fit. And this is where I'm hoping the mayor a couple of weeks can, can help is one of, the, one of the good things about the Western Cape is we have a very red tape light government at the, at the provincial level. We're hoping it'll get better at the national level. And what the job of government is not is to not come in the way of a startup's progress. What they need to help is with R&D grants, tax subsidies. There are startup acts in countries like Senegal and Tunisia that provide tax-free subsidies for up to eight years for founders. I've known a few South African founders that have relocated their entire business to Dakar or Tunis because of those incentives. So be open to that. Again, understand if the city that you live in has some of these criteria and then pivot accordingly, right? Um, gosh, I'm gonna have to get to these quick. This is normally three hours. What we look for in investing, take pictures, people. Team, I mentioned earlier, um, if you don't have a co-founder, please get one. Um, find them somewhere. <laughs> at Innovation City. You might find founders at Innovation City, right? There are so many incredible programs here. Um, single founders are risky. Um, not just because of the physical aspect, the liability of being run over by a bus. I don't know why everyone talks about getting hit by a bus. But um, it's also having a, a person that you can agreeably disagree with that challenges your belief systems on market product scale. So co-founders are very important. The ideal number of co-founders in a startup is three. Two is okay. One is too less, four is too many. Yoko has four co-founders. I'll just leave it at that. Um, TAM, total addressable market, right? Again, think big, go global, right? Um, traction, traction has a lot of different meanings, but it's essentially, it's either revenue, distribution, transaction volume, number of users, do enough research to figure out what metric is relevant for your industry. So for example, if you're an e-commerce company, the number of daily, monthly, and weekly active users, super important. If you're a digital bank, what's important? The lifetime value of your customers and the average revenue that a customer will generate from you over his or her life. Digital banks are valued as a function of their lifetime value of their customers. So if you look at most digital banks like N26, Monzo, uh, New Bank in Brazil, or the ones we have here, like Time, et cetera, they're valued as a function of their total number of active users and their lifetime value. But if you as a founder haven't done enough research in that and, and all you think of is revenue, 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 but the VCs know what metrics make sense in that industry, there's a fundamental disconnect. So understand what traction metric makes sense for your industry and work on those metrics, right? Technology, super important. If you can't build it yourself, get someone else to build it for you, but technology is a huge moat. Um, transformation, I'm gonna skip some of these. Timing. Timing is often the hardest thing to get right, but often the most important. What's crazy about timing is that every single market leader in any industry in the tech field 
was not the first to market, often not even the second to market. And how many of you are old enough to know of companies like Ask Jeeves or Lycos? Anyone here know those companies? Some people have been an old fart like me. I'm 41, funny enough. I don't think I look 41, but yes, but yes. Um, Instagram was not the world's first photo sharing app and neither was Skype the world's first VOIP and the list goes on forever. The key thing is here, here's the trick guys, is to be first to market but have a minimal viable product that is good enough for early adopters but mature enough to let others fail and then ride on those coattails. Does that make sense? It's a bit like Machiavellian. Has anyone read like The Art of War, Shinzu? Oh, shit, another big, the biggest advice. Read books, people. Read books. Don't scroll. Stop scrolling. Read books. Like read, read, read classic books. Like read The Art of War. Read To Kill a Mockingbird. Read, I don't know, Zero to One. Read, read books, people. Like actual physical books where you can spell the pages. I read a lot. Reading is important because it pushes the way you think. And this is a bit counterintuitive. I'm digressing here. Read fiction. You want to ask me a question? Yeah. How, so how do we think about time? Like, so you don't want to be so so should that think about the MVP? Yeah, 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 yeah. Gosh, are you not online? Gosh, GitHub, um, Reddit, like um, our friends at Skirmish can help us. How do you find early adopters? How do you find like, yeah. Yeah, I've got four minutes left, fuck. Okay, there is time for Q&A and I'll do part two. <laughs> so I'll, do a part two. I'll do a part two, I'll do a part two. But there's, yeah, early adopters. I mean, read a book called Crossing the Chasm by, uh, forget the guy's name. But you've got to target those guys at the, at the early part of the bell curve. And you've got to be very, almost have to be a sleuth to know when to release your product. So you can completely, excuse my French, like fuck your competitor. There are a few examples of that happening in South Africa right now. But companies that were first to market raised at ridiculous valuations on the, on the one-liner. We're the first in this country to do this. And then a bunch of foolish VCs pump a lot of money. And then a few months later, the, the, the consumers are like, but it doesn't work. Or there's this bug or that bug, like WTF. And then you have the smart, like second, the first follower that says, hey, we know how to fix that. So timing's everything, but it's the hardest thing to get right. I wish I could give you a proper answer, but very few to the first to market get it right. But yeah, timings. And the last thing is 10x. I mean, I should actually call it 100x, but 10x is the minimum return you have to have in mind within three to five years to make money for your VCs. Um, last few things and then I'll stop and then we'll, we'll take questions. Um, as an early stage startup, unit economics are super important. One of the most important things to think of as a founder is what is your lifetime value to the cost of acquiring customers. Most founders have that. Try and keep it above three and monitor it every month, right? Hopefully that should go up. If it's going down, reassess. Um, EBITDA margins for the accountants here. EBITDA margins will always be negative as a startup, right? But it's about how less negative they are over a period of time. So you look at your EBITDA margin combined with your EBITDA margin growth. And that's something that VCs look at a lot at. Growth to churn, right? A lot of founders will spend tons of money on SEO and marketing on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, you name it. But they've got a leaky bucket. They don't care about retention. It's a huge problem. Huge, huge problem. Um, so the growth to churn. In fact, I, I gave a talk a while ago about marketing. I'm not even a marketing guy. But acquisition, retention, referrals, extremely important. And then virality. The moment you get a customer, don't assume that they're yours to keep forever. How are you incentivizing every single customer to stay and refer more people? 
right? Your virality coefficient is extremely important. Um, I spoke about B2B, B2B to C business models, insurance acquisition. Um, when you build companies, especially in the sort of circular economy, don't get too fussed about price. Um, rather balance that with convenience and time. One of the hardest commodities and the most hardest to, to measure is how important someone's time is. So that's the reason we pay 30% more for food delivered to us and groceries, knowing very well that we're getting fleeced. Because since 2010, with the sharing economy, people value time and convenience a lot more than price and quality. And the VCs and investors that didn't get that memo are the ones that are suffering now. So always keep in mind that the price elasticity curve from the 80s and 90s is not so elastic anymore. Time and convenience are often significantly more important um, than that. And then one of my favorite things here is revenue. How many of you have, again, back to reading books, how many of you have read Animal Farm? Oh, wow. Jeez. So all animals are equal, some animals are more equal, four legs good, four legs good, two legs bad. Yeah. Similar analogy, all revenue is equal, but some revenues are more equal. Very quickly, the most beautiful, sticky revenue that us VCs love is SaaS. Sassy. Software as a service. Subscription recurring revenue that attracts penalties for canceling. Ooh, I love a little bit of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm so bad. <laughs> but what does that mean? Have, have, uh, has anyone here bought something on Adobe? Adobe Pro Reader, anyone? What happens if you cancel after seven days? Good luck, exactly. <laughs> what do you get billed for the entire year? Even if you try and cancel your credit card, <laughs> they'll still go to your bank and collect money. <laughs> it's funny. Anyway, so subscription revenue with penalties is the holy grail of revenue. It's, re it's, it's recurring, it attracts penalties, and that's the R in MRR that VCs love. Very few of you guys, you guys founders have that. The second highest revenue is just plain subscription revenue where if you cancel, it goes away. It's recurring until canceled. And then you've got revenue which is just pure transaction fee driven, right? So I'd give you a service or a product and I charge you a fee or commission. It isn't linked to volume. So you could have no volume in a given month or a dip, but you still have commission because you're providing a service. It's like admin fees, commission fees, whatever. Below that you have transaction volume driven revenue. So for those in the retail tech industry or the e-commerce industry, it's linked to the volume of payments, volume of purchases, whatever the case may be. That is slightly lower on the total pole of the quality of your revenue. It's seasonal, but it ain't bad. Below that you have project revenue, just POCs. I'm doing a one year contract with MTN to do this project, I get paid a lump sum. I'll stop now, yeah. A lot of you guys, startups have project revenue, POC, pilot revenue, okay, but not great. Why? Two reasons, not recurring, has a finite life. And the worst revenue, bottom of the barrel revenue, that a lot of startups have, is what? Consulting revenue, to keep the lights on. And it's basically people selling their time, which is what accountants and lawyers do. And they're good at it, but don't do it as a startup. So the reality is good VCs, when they say, okay, show me your projections for the last, sorry, for the next, I don't know, 12 months, and show me your historical revenues. And if a VC says, hey, can I access your bank accounts? Sure. But what do the good, the really good VCs say? Break it down. They're like, ooh, consulting revenue, project revenue, transaction revenue, subscription revenue. 
The multiples that we will pay depend on what part of the totem pole you fall on. So if you have recurring revenue, subscription SaaS revenue as a payments company, you can get as high as 10, 20 times multiple, right? If you're a project-based revenue, you might even get less than one, like half X. So when VCs value you, trust me, we do, there's a lot of science that goes into how we value companies that you may not know of, but now you do, right? Um, this book here, awesome book about some of the best innovations coming out of Africa. That's another discussion all in itself. I'm gonna stop here. Um, 30 seconds more. Business models, right? Please just bear with me. I'll, I'll be quick. There's so much wisdom in here. Yeah, quicker, yes. I'll, I'll speak French. Um, bait and hook, look, try and look at revenue models where you sell a product or service, but you have a lot of ancillary products along with it. So take this as an example, razors, phones, printers, air fresheners. How can you apply that model to your service? The digital version of this is antivirus, as an example, figure, right? Um, freemium models. Everyone gets this? Um, sorry, there's one more here. Oh, for fuck's sake. There we go, subscription revenue models. If you can't figure it out, get someone to hack how to, how to create fake elusive ways of generating subscription revenues by making something appear lucrative. Spotify does this exceptionally well. I'm sure you guys, Netflix and Spotify, the kings of subscription revenue. On demand. Models, take out the middlemen. Do you even know what the Dollar Shave Club is? Anyone here old enough to know what the Dollar Shave Club is? What an incredible business model, right? So when people come to you and say hypermarket, so make a lot of something and discount it heavily, right? But again, there are digital versions of this. One of the challenges I'm gonna to pose to you is think of what the digital equivalents of all these business models are. And the next time you talk to a VC, and he or she asks you, why do you only have one revenue line item? Don't reply to them saying, because that's what we do. <laughs> because that's not what you can do. So these are some of the, the different types of business models that every tech startup should be looking at. And if you haven't looked at it, this is the worst situation. If you've got a really good business, and we as the VC have figured out Ooh, fuck. We can take this to the skies. We will listen to your pitch and we will go and build it ourselves. I'm sorry, I said it. And you can shoot me if you like. But the reality is, if you have an incredible product and you haven't figured this shit out, it's your fault. We're giving you the tools to do it. And it's about time that if you can't build it yourself, hire people to do it. But remember what I said earlier, if you want to be as big as a bank in five years to, take, to get money from us, you really have to figure this out. Otherwise, don't talk to VCs, right? Last slide, valuation. Uh, Michelle, I'll do a whole talk about this later, part two. But people talk to me about valuation. I don't care how long you've been in business. There are businesses that have been around for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years and are still worth diddly squat. There are some businesses that have been around for a few days, I kid you not, a few days that are worth a lot of money. Again, let's see how old you guys are. Who knows uh, what the million, the million dollar website? You know? The pixel one, right? The pixel one, yeah. It reached a valuation of $10 million in about 48 hours. They built a website in the late 90s and they sold one pixel, thousand by thousand pixels, and they sold one pixel to advertisers. Initially for a dollar, but once they got beyond 500,000 pixels, it became a secondary market for trading, and that startup was worth tens of millions of dollars in 48 hours. Why am I saying this? Valuation is not a function of time. It's not a function of funding. There are some startups that have received lots of money, but I but, haven't, but, but aren't worth a lot. Valuation is a function of validation. That's it. QED. Who knows what QED is? No one? No physicist in the house? Yes, all right. Validation versus valuation. 
and that's it. I'm done. Uh, and 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 for and for crying out loud, I don't care what religion you are, Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, Jewish, whatever, atheist, read this book, please. The Five Agreements. It is as important for you in life as it is in business. And trust me, it'll help you as founders, as human beings. It's helped me a lot deal with the, the craziness of the world I live in. So read a lot, watch less TV, read more, drink lots of water, and do your homework for VCs. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.